Yeah, absolutely. So I think most of us uh, know and love uh, Judge Rancourt, uh, she's part of our uh, Rotary Club here. Um, you know, we're excited to hear her speak and have, have her give us an update on, uh, you know, how the courts are uh, adapting with COVID. Um, she did mention that uh, uh, for whatever reason, she was a little bit nervous to present to Rotary, but I told her, uh, no worries, we won't judge you on your speech. So let's welcome uh, Judge Rancourt. Thank you. Um, I am excited to speak with you and tell you what's going on. We've had a lot going on in the last few months, but I also am nervous and also not very tech savvy. So I'm going to go ahead and try and share my screen here and see if I can get it to show what we're Let's see here. All right. Is everyone able to still hear me okay? Good. It's real good, Jen. Okay, perfect. Um, well, um, as, as I'm sure with every one of you in your different industries, uh, we have um, been trying to evolve and adapt over the last few months to uh, continue to provide services to our community um, while, you know, obviously taking the health concerns into consideration. Um, I'm really proud of uh, the Sonoma County District Court in that um, we have throughout this entire process, uh, we have not closed our doors for a single day. Uh, many courts around the county, or not in the county and in the state, for example, have um, had to close their doors for, for periods of time. Um, some of them are pretty limited still in what hearings they're able to hear. Um, but because of leadership that we have had uh, with our presiding judge and um, some guidance from the state, we have uh, taken precautions since March and have been able to keep our doors open. Um, at different times, it's been with pretty limited services, but um, we have continued to be open every single day. Um, I wanted to just give you kind of, first of all, just an idea of what, oops, go back, uh, just an idea of what our uh, courts do on a daily basis uh, or on an annual basis. So you kind of have an idea of what um, we were starting out with and then how we had to adapt. So this just gives you an overview of um, the caseloads from 2019, what um, our whole court dealt with, first of all, in Snohomish County. Um, as you can see the numbers there, let's see, I'm, I'm, hold, I'm hiding them. Um, that accounts for all four divisions. So we have nine judicial officers um, spread out through four different divisions. There are three of them located down in uh, Linwood. There's two out in Monroe, two in Everett, and then there's myself. And then we have a halftime commissioner here in, in the Cascade Division in Arlington. So you can see just kind of the numbers is, of what we dealt with in 2019, just to kind of give you a comparison of what we we're um, starting out with. As you can see, obviously the, the bulk of our filings are infractions. We had about 9,900 of them just here in our division, but um, those are the least time consuming. The ones that are really the time consuming are the criminal matters and the small claims and the protection orders. Those are our more substantive matters that we deal with. And so just kind of a breakdown of what we do. Our, our um, district courts only handle cases where individual for criminal matters where individuals are looking at um, spending one year or less in jail. So we don't handle any felony matters. It's all misdemeanor and gross misdemeanor offenses. Um, still some pretty darn serious offenses, um, some pretty um, serious domestic violence issues, uh, DUIs, but um, anything that's looking, anyone, anytime someone's looking at a year or more, or more than a year in jail, uh, they will head to superior court. So just kind of a breakdown of what we did last year um, as a starting point. Uh, once we were, um, given notice, you know, when, once it became obvious that we are going to um, have to start um, taking serious, making serious changes to our practices uh, when COVID start uh, first took, became on the forefront, um, we had to really take a look at what are our essential functions. We um, made the determination, like I said, early on that we couldn't close our doors entirely. Uh, we didn't even close our doors, limit our hours really at all. Um, we kept our doors open, but we uh, started taking precautions immediately. We required our staff um, from very early on to, uh, they were using gloves, uh, putting on masks. We had daily uh, sanitation routines that we to put into place right away. Um, because as you can imagine, we have a, our staff have a contact with a lot of uh, members of the community on a daily basis. Um, but we took a look at what are our essential functions? What do we have to focus on while there is a pandemic and what can we kind of put aside? Um, it became real clear that we had two areas that were um, 
our primary focus that we had to focus on. And those were our in custody matters. So those are people who either were just arrested um, by law enforcement and had been just booked into the jail. So we need to take a look at whether or not there's a basis for them to be held. And if not, what conditions of release should be set. Um, and then there's also folks who've been held in custody and, and obviously need to have um, their matters resolved in a timely fashion. So we focused our efforts uh, right away on, um, we started limiting the other types of hearings that we had, focused our efforts on our in-custody matters. Um, we handle those actually, um, interestingly enough, uh, the district court handles all the in-custody matters out of the Cascade Division four days a week. So Monday through Friday, or Monday through Thursday, um, it's generally our commissioner in the morning. We do a video calendar. Um, so we were kind of uh, from the, uh, that feeds from the jail into our, our division. So we, again, we handle them right from Arlington. So we were kind of ahead, in the, ahead of the game in many ways when it came to in custody matters because we had already had it set up. So it was a video feed from the jail here. Um, it really limited, we've always had pretty limited uh, transport of individuals on that calendar um, for a variety of reasons, but mostly staffing. Um, so again, we were able to, um, pivot and, and focus on those matters. The other matter, the other types of matters that were, um, that we really focused on and just could not uh, set aside were our uh, protection orders. Uh, we, these were, uh, we had to determine quickly how we were gonna handle these uh, very pressing matters. So these are individuals who are coming to the court seeking um, protection from domestic violence, um, protection from anti-harassment anti protection, uh, sexual assault protection orders and extreme risk protection orders. Um, these had, again, with the in custody matters, uh, these other matters had to be um, our top priority. So we had to figure out how are we going to minimize the amount of people in the courthouse while still addressing these issues. So um, very, very early on, these all became telephonic hearings. We switched from in-person appearances to telephonic hearings for most of these types of hearings. Um, and certainly we're making accommodations for anyone uh, who that wouldn't work for and we would allow them into the courthouse, but it was very, very limited. Um, the other obligation that we have is to have an open courtroom. So um, the courtroom remained open, the doors remained open, folks were allowed to come in and view those hearings. But again, we were trying to minimize the amount of contact our staff and uh, the community had here at the court. So we made those immediately telephonic hearings. All other hearings for a couple of months were pretty much um, most of the meeting, uh, other types of hearings were continued uh, for several months uh, when we first, when this all started happening in, in March. Uh, fairly early on, but not really, <laughs> it didn't feel soon enough for some of us. Um, we did get some guidance from the Supreme Court um, telling us how we can address these issues. Um, the the, uh, the courts are obviously bound by, you know, the, the constitutional requ requirements of the Constitution, both the state and the uh, federal Constitution, but also court rules and statutes and, and case law that interpret those rules. So we had a lot of our types, multiple types of hearings that have time limits, um, certain uh, guidelines as to how quickly we have to hear matters. Um, uh, and it became pretty apparent that in the context of COVID, those rules were not going to work for us um, and were not workable um, when we're balancing the safety of, of the community. So luckily again, not it didn't seem quickly enough, but uh, the Supreme Court did come out with some guidance to help us with that. And um, then they also, the, the Supreme Court did recognize that individual jurisdictions each have very different needs um, and concerns based on the location, the staffing, et cetera. And so they, one of the Supreme, things the Supreme Court did was to recognize that each of the individual uh, jurisdictions has quite a bit of, uh, gave us quite a bit of power to um, adapt our own rules to make it appropriate for our different uh, jurisdictions. So just to give you come up, kind of some ideas of what the Supreme Court told us, um, they told us that um, initially, we, we've gone through several iterations. I think we're on the fourth or fifth Supreme Court order now, but um, initially it was basically shut down the courts as much as you can and, um, you know, for, in, for this for a very short period of time. Um, and then it kind of evolved and they gave us uh, some more clear guidance on how we could reopen safely. Um, the, the whole, the mandate from the very beginning is to that we are to follow all health guidelines and to utilize remote proceedings whenever it's appropriate. Um, at the we didn't have much guidance as to what remote proceedings were. So again, we started out with telephonic hearings. 
Um, again, uh, at the beginning, they uh, again they told us to focus just on emergency matters. So again, those were the the people who were seeking emergency protection orders and who were in custody. That became the, really the focus of most of our proceedings. Um, as time has evolved, they have expanded what types of services that uh, uh, they've expanded the type of service that is allowed. So what I mean by service is the notice to the other party. So um, we have pretty, pretty strict requirements as to what constitutes service to another party. They've really loosened those restrictions. They allow a lot more things to be uh, served via mail as opposed to a personal service. Um, they're also allowing the use of electronic signatures and attorneys to sign for their own for the parties. Um, you can imagine that um, not having people appear in the court, we're used to having signatures <laughs> after signature after signature on every document, and not having people in appearing in front of us to get those signatures uh, was one of the very first uh, huge hurdles that we faced. So the Supreme Court order uh, allowed us to expand what the definition of a signature was. It allows us again to have electronic signatures. It allows attorneys to sign for their clients. Um, gave us a lot more flexibility in the types of uh, proceedings that we could have. Um, they told us again that in custody matters had to be heard via phone or video whenever feasible. Uh, again, we were lucky because we were ahead of the game on that. We for years have been hearing um, our in custody matters via a video feed. Um, let's see. Oh, I already have that. I already just talked about five. Um, one of the big uh, uh, pushes about um, through all of this has been that we need to try and limit the amount of people that are held in custody, um, whether that meant not issuing bench warrants or it meant uh, reassessing the factors that we considered when help holding someone on a criminal offense. Um, but it's been a direct uh, directive from the Supreme Court that, that just become a priority is kind of clearing out uh, when possible and when it's safety, when it doesn't compromise community safety um, to try and limit the number of incarcerated individuals. I'm sorry, one of the first slides I showed you was the jail. Um, let me go back to that. <clears throat> so this chart here is actually what the daily jail population, you can see what happened to it, it dropped dramatically. Um, this, this is a combination of efforts between this, the county prosecuting attorney's office, the courts, um, and law enforcement, um, you can see in uh, about, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't have the dates on here, but about March when we started hearing about this, um, we uh, released several people from custody. The, the Supreme, or the Superior Court released several people from custody. Again, um, still considering public safety risks, but these were some, some of these folks were serving um, sentences. We could put them on alternatives, et cetera, but to try and minimize the risk of exposure in, in the uh, correctional facilities. Our correctional, um, our jail here in Snohomish County has done um, what I believe has been an incredible job of safety precautions. We get daily reports of how many folks are incarcerated. And again, this is a chart of how it's gone over time since uh, this started out. They started out around 800. We went down to about, oh, there were times when I think we were just below 300. We're right around 450, 500 in the jail right now on, pretty, on a pretty steady basis. But again, that was to minimize uh, risk of exposure in the jail. And um, they've done an excellent job. They have made it so that um, most, if not every inmate at this point is being held in a single person cell. There's strict protocols that are being followed. Um, they've had a very, very low incidence of folks with uh, COVID in the jail. And the ones that have had COVID in the jail um, have, it's my understanding, have tested positive prior to coming in. So they were even, most of them they were aware of when they came in. Um, so they were able to minimize the exposure to other people when they were in. So um, after we had that, uh, Supreme Court order. Um, we have uh, a kind of a hierarchy here at this at the district court. Judge uh, Fair out of the South Division is our presiding judge. So he was tasked, um, obviously, with all of our input to uh, come up with policies to fit our particular situation. So we um, immediately, and I think um, even even before we had too much guidance from the Supreme Court. Uh, again, laid out pretty strict policies about social distancing, about use of face coverings. And you can imagine early on in this process, that was not a very popular <laughs> position for us as the bench to be taking. But um, we recognize that and we're listening to the health officials and we're trying to take all their uh, directives very, very seriously, not just for um, the community, but also, frankly, for our staff. If, if we have one person, we our division is pretty darn small. If we have one person who gets infected, we are uh, going to be in a world of hurt. Um, so in addition to you know, social distancing, facial coverings, we 
uh, while we were limiting the number of hearings, we were having rotating staff. So we would only have half of our staff here at a time, just so that we could, again, minimize the number of people interacting. Um, if you come to the courthouse now, you'll see that we have uh, screens, or not screens, we have the plexiglass in between all of the clerk stations and um, uh, hand sanitizer and spray about everywhere you look. Um, so after we were, after we took care of that, we had to scramble and figure out how are we going to now get back on track and start doing hearings. And so all of us uh, quickly became, um, as tried to learn <laughs> and are still trying to learn the Zoom format. So our hearings have, for the very, for the most part, have become Zoom format. So I spend most of my day uh, doing this, even though it makes me uh, uncomfortable because I'm not super tech savvy, but I'm learning and I'm not probably the, the least tech savvy of the judges. I'm probably out in the middle. Um, so we also allowed for, our focus was to minimize the number of people coming into the court. So we uh, adapted the Zoom format for most of our hearings. We also allowed for a lot more written agreements between parties. Uh, generally on a criminal matter, parties would be required to appear in person. Um, we started allowing some agreed orders where, so the parties wouldn't have to appear. Um, big thing for us was uh, for a period of time, the Supreme Court um, had ceased jury trials in the state of Washington. And um, it became obvious, obviously we can't do that forever. And so we had to scramble this summer and try to figure out how on earth are we going to um, hold a jury trial when I have a tiny courtroom, which is um, barely big enough to hold a jury as it is right now, uh, let alone when we're using social distancing. So um, what our order uh, recognized was that we don't have any courtrooms in the district court that are large enough to have a jury pool. So it, it gave us a grounds to continue trials if we didn't have enough space. Luckily for all four divisions, we have been all been very lucky to, to partner with different um, agencies uh, throughout the county. Here in the Cascade Division, uh, I reached out to uh, Paul Ellis and the city of Arlington and said, hey, what kind of buildings can you help me out with um, to try and give me some more space to uh, select a jury? And we have been very lucky to have the use of um, the PUD conference room down in uh, down at Heller Park. So we have been able to uh, begin doing jury trials again. We do our jury selection down at Heller Park. It's been, it's, I think we've done four now. It's worked out fabulously. The city has been incredibly generous in there uh, letting us use that. So we're really excited about that partnership. Um, again, another thing the local rule did was to prioritize the hearings and procedures um, which will decrease the likelihood of incarceration. So that means that uh, we are hearing things on a more rapid basis. If someone is picked up on a bench warrant, we can hear those more quickly. If someone has a bench warrant, we quash those more quickly. Um, again, trying to balance getting the, the needs of the court taken care of while uh, decreasing the uh, risk and exposure to folks. So here's what our courts look like right now. Um, just a second. <laughs> This is what a hearing looks like. <laughs> um, I have, this is what most of our hearings look like right now is um, I have a screen and I have many, many folks and we try to hold court in this manner. It's been really successful for the most part. Um, we've actually had a lot better, I think, um, I'm just anecdotally, I haven't actually written down the numbers, but it feels like anecdotally, a lot better attendance at court because folks are given this option of appearing uh, from the comfort of their home home, from their workplace, from wherever it is. Um, and again, it's had, we've had a lot of benefits to having uh, this form, this format. Uh, some of the downsides is it's also pretty distracting when someone is uh, smoking cigarettes or drinking beer or cooking breakfast when they're doing this. So we do have to try and keep um, some control over the behavior that's taking place. But for the most part, we've been really lucky. Um, this is what our court, uh, this is my bench here. You can see, obviously, we've got all the shields up for uh, protecting the clerk, um, limiting contact to the clerk. This is our courtroom. So you'll see that, you know, on a good day, it's not a huge courtroom, but um, the yellow stickers that you see are those seats which allow for social distancing. So um, I have now seven seats available in the court, or about one, two, three, four, five, five seats in the gallery. I have a couple over in the jury box and then a couple up at council table. So we have very limited um, seating that's available. But again, we are strictly enforcing any social distancing requirements at the courthouse. Um, masks are an absolute must. This is our jury box. So when we do have a jury that um, once it's chosen at Heller Park, we do come back to the courthouse and then I seat folks, two of them in the jury box and the others out in the gallery, um, which is a little bit unique. Um, all over the courthouse, we have 
what I'm sure you guys have at all of your places of work are, you know, sanitizers, um, masks. We hand out sanit we hand out little bottles of sanitizer to all jury members. We give them all masks. Um, the, the reason I took a picture of these masks is uh, one of the unique things facing a court is that we're um, either a jury or a judge is required in many cases to assess credibility. For a lot of people, the, part of that assessing credibility is facial expression. So early on, it became uh, quite a question of how are we going to deal with that if we have masks on. So uh, the courts have supplied uh, these types of masks that allow us to see people. Um, our law enforcement officers who've used them do not appreciate that very much, but <laughs> we have to do it. Um, just I want to give you kind of a picture of where we're at in terms of filings this year after COVID. So the, uh, my uh, court supervisor pulled me some numbers throughout through yesterday. And to, just to give you a picture, uh, we're not really slowing down too much in terms of numbers. We're, we're at 74% of filings from last year. Um, most notably, uh, if you take a look at our criminal filings, we're at 186% of last year. And that is due to two factors. It's not because people are committing a lot more crimes. It's because <laughs> uh, we were lucky to partner with the city of Arlington and take back the Arlington caseload uh, this year. Uh, thanks Chief Ventura working with us. So um, a lot of that is city of Arlington cases, um, which we didn't have in 2019. The other part of that is that we had a lot of prosecutors at the county who were sitting around with nothing to do when we weren't holding hearings. And so they took the huge piles of cases that were sitting on their desks and filed a whole bunch of really old cases. So um, they have, for my court, for the most part, uh, most of the cases have a two-year statute of limitations. And so we got a lot of cases that were a little bit old, but still within that statute of limitations that have been filed lately. So we got a heavy dose of new criminal filings in the last few months. Um, the other area that I think is worth noting um, the increase is the protection orders. As you can imagine, uh, when you have people crammed into houses and staying home all the time and um, it gets and with a lot of tension we've had a lot a lot of filings for protection orders um, a, that's a, lar a larger percentage of those are domestic violence orders than they were last year and um, frankly the the allegations and the disputes seem to be a lot more serious than the anti-harassment orders than they have been in the past so um, the tension is definitely out there and we're definitely seeing that in the disputes that are coming to the court um, small claims are down dramatically um, for a variety of reasons. I'm sure people are, uh, they're not leaving their house, but also right now there's a ban on eviction. So that decreases the number of landlord tenant. A lot of our small claims are landlord tenant issues. So we don't have a lot of uh, landlord tenant issues coming in front of us right now. Um, it hasn't been all bad though. Um, it has, we've had some really positive things come out with, come out of this. Um, most notably, uh, like I noted, uh, we've really had an opportunity to uh, have stronger ties with the community here in Arlington. Um, again, really appreciate their use, the use of the building down at Heller Park. Um, we have had several technology upgrades through the CARES Act. So those have been funded through fun, uh, money funneled through both the county and the court system um, through the CARES Act has brought us some, a lot of new technology that was probably um, we needed to have come anyway. Um, one of the things I've appreciated most about this process is that we meet all the time with our stakeholders now. So we didn't do it as much, you know, um, an object that's in motion tends to stay in motion. We kind of kept going at the same, doing the same things over and over again for years. Um, but this has kind of forced us out of that comfort zone. And uh, in order, it became really obvious early on that we couldn't do it on our, make these changes on our own. So we've been meeting with public defenders, prosecutors, uh, city officials, um, as much as we can to try and um, come to new, you know, uh, make it through this process. And I also think um, a real benefit to this is the, in, uh, the increased access to courts. I think Zoom is probably something that is here to stay for a lot of types of our cases. It's great to see people being able to appear from their house or their workplace to, for an infraction hearing, for example, instead of having to spend their day or their morning traveling to the court. Um, I think that um, it makes it a lot easier and a lot more, um, again, accessible. We have a lot of folks who don't have licenses, so it's really nice that they don't have to spend two hours on the bus. Um, so again, I, I think there's some real positives that are coming out of this experience as well. So that's what's going on with the courts right now. Does anyone have any questions? So your honor, what? Oh. go ahead. Sorry, Dave, I didn't mean to talk on you. Um, Judge Rancourt, I'm surprised that you were nervous because I felt like that was really phenomenal. Thank you for um, that presentation. That was great. Thank you, ma'am. Um, just curious on a on a more personal level, because you are out and about in the community, are you getting flack? Um, not even so much from what's happening locally, but what we're seeing in the media 
further south with you know criminal being let go how is that impacting your daily activities as you pick up your groceries and get your gas and all that stuff um well luckily um <laughs> district court judges are pretty anonymous <laughs> i mean I not, not a lot of people know what I do. Not, my neighbors don't probably know what I do either. Um, but um, as far as the courts go, uh, we are definitely, it's, we are getting, I'm on the, I'm on several committees at the state level and, and then we definitely have direct mandates to, to making changes and to see how uh, our courts have perpetuated some of the problems that exist right now. Um, the more, the most uh, press, the most uh, salient for me right now that I can address is that um, in terms of poverty issues and how um, the courts have perpetuated, you know, the criminalization of poverty. Um, one step that my court has, my court, meaning the other judges in my district or in my um, jurisdiction have allowed me to start a relicensing program here, for example. So we are, we're trying to do what little things we can do at the court level to address some of these obviously much larger social, social, social issues. Um, the way our relicensing program works is that, um, you know, folks who have outstanding fines and fees to the courts, lose their license, they, um, not always, but for the most part, lose their license if they're not able to make those payments. And so uh, we're recognizing that, hey, that's on us, maybe that we should do something to work with these folks. And so again, uh, my courts allowed me to start a relicensing program where I can allow people to come into the court and address those socioeconomic issues. We can convert fines to community service, com commu uh, convert fines to treatment. I could go on and on for days, but um, just the idea that we need to take steps proactively as courts to address some of these issues that we may have perpetuated in the past. So um, it probably doesn't quite directly answer your question, but um, we're very cognizant of it. We have directives directly from the Supreme Court that we need to be cognizant of it and to be taking all those factors into consideration. So Judge, you said you picked up the Arlington uh, work, uh, prosecutions and that sort of thing. Uh, what other municipalities are is the district court here now handling? We handle uh, Granite Falls, uh, we, which is uh, the sheriff's office handles Granite Falls as well. So we have Granite Falls and city of Stanwood and city of Arlington are three municipalities. We also just started taking filings within the last month, I wanna say very, very recently from uh, still Guamish inf infractions from the still Guamish tribe. So um, in addition to all the county and state pieces, obviously. With the uh, use of Zoom, um, where people are in their homes and you can kind of see what's, you know, going on behind them. Has that caused any issues in court um, where they're, you know, defending themselves in court yet? And you're, you talked about credibility, but something's happening behind them that, you know, might enter into the decision process. Hundred percent, absolutely. I've had um, folks who are driving down the street while they're on Zoom with their suspended licenses. I've had folks, uh, the most obvious one to me was, I had a city of Arlington uh, case and I actually didn't recognize at the time, but we had um, a husband and a wife who were both on my calendar, the husband and wife uh, for different types of charges. And apparently we're, we're Zooming from the same room together. Um, one of the, and, and there's a no contact order between the two parties. So um, the city of Arlington prosecutor very kindly pointed out to me that maybe they shouldn't be in the same room while they're in court on video. Um, so, yeah, it, it definitely is interesting. I mean, that some of the, the behavior has been completely inappropriate. Like I said, for the most part, it's been, people have been very respectful and it's been very positive, but every once in a while, it's a little, not so much. Hey, I just wanted to say that the protection orders didn't surprise me because uh, Kimberly was a teacher and my daughter Grace is now a teacher and that's kind of a sad uh, thing about all of this but you know I really appreciated the update I I had no idea what was going on on your side and we don't until we actually hear from somebody else in another I'll call it industry or area so very informing thank you you're welcome hi judge thank you for your presentation um, I just had a couple questions absolutely uh, one on the uh, moratorium on evictions. How does that apply to commercial customers? You know, I honestly, I'll be honest with you, I do not know the answer to that. We don't actually, hand, our district court does not handle actual evictions. The, what we get is the kind of the downfall of it is um, when there's a dispute after how much, you know, is, should have been returned in the rental agreement or, you know, when there's a monetary dispute after the eviction takes place. Um, I don't know the answer to the commercial. As far as I know, it is just residential, but I'm not positive. 
Thank you. Um, second question. Um, I actually didn't think I was going to make it to this meeting today because I was supposed to have jury duty in the court today. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when I called in last night, they said, no, nothing is going on. You're done. You don't have to come in Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. Uh, what happened? Uh, great question. We actually had a trial up until Monday afternoon. Um, I don't, I don't know the details of why they'd made this decision, but the state of Washington dismissed the charges against the individual who was set for trial this week. So um, up until Monday afternoon, I was fully expecting that we would see folks like you here. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh -huh. so, so Bryce had to leave for an emergency, so yeah. we're, we're past our time. And I really uh, thank you very much, uh, you. Your Honor, for telling us what's going on with the courts. Absolutely, thank you for letting me do that.